Hi, everyone. Welcome to the New York City Bar Association Mindfulness and Wellbeing and Law Committee as we present Unlocking the Power of Sleep to Thrive in Work and Life. I'd love to introduce our presenters today, Kendra Brodine and Dr. Bishwadia. Kendra is the founder and CEO of Esquire Well, a lawyer well-being and professional development company providing speaking, coaching, consulting, and online learning tools to help lawyers be happier, healthier, and more successful. Kendra is a certified coach and an adjunct professor of law at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, where she teaches well-being and professional formation. With a master's degree in social work, a law degree, and nearly 20 years of professional experience in legal professional development and well-being in both large law firms and law schools, Kendra brings together the people side and the business side of the law as she guides legal organizations and their people to thrive now and in the future. Dr. Bishwadia is a board certified internal medicine doctor, pulmonary and sleep, and certified in pulmonary and sleep medicine. Passionate about reducing barriers to sleep apnea care, he is founder of a national sleep telemedicine practice. Sleep Med RX, serving every U.S. state. Using a state-of-the-art telemedicine platform and cutting-edge home sleep testing technology, the patient journey from sleep diagnosis to prescription has been transformed from its current complexity to becoming accessible and affordable. He currently serves as Chief Medical Officer at Whole U and is a consultant for Ectosense. Dr. Bishwadia has been named top doc by the Minneapolis Magazine, as well as US News and World Report. He served as president for the Minnesota Sleep Society from 2016 to 2018, and is active in promoting sleep health in Minnesota. He also has an MBA from the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. We are thrilled to be here with you. We are both sitting in Minneapolis and uh, and excited to be talking with new friends and, and colleagues across the country in there in New York City. And wherever you're sitting right now, knowing that we live in this new remote world, you might be already somewhere else for Memorial Day weekend and watching us from somewhere else. But what we hope to do is share with you some insights about sleep and how to get better sleep as such a critical component of well-being. So um, I'm thrilled to be able to work again with my, my friend and colleague, Jagdeep Bajwadia, who I have learned so much about sleep from, and he is just a tremendous resource. So let's jump in. As we go along, we invite you to drop your questions into the Q&A. We will answer them in real time. I'll be watching for those. So you don't have to save them up for the end. You can drop them in at any point. And um, to the extent that they're on topic with what we're talking about, we'll answer them right away. If they're not, if they're just a general question, we'll save it toward the end. And then we'll do a whole Q&A period at the end. So I always say when, whenever I get to work with Jagdeep, you have a preeminent sleep expert at your disposal right now. Take advantage of him and his expertise. He's amazing at just talking through whatever is happening for you and giving you some recommendations. So Jagdeep, why don't we jump in? Tell us a little bit about how sleep actually impacts our health, our mental well-being. How does sleep or lack thereof hurt or help us? Sure. Uh, first of all, what a thrill to be here again with you and uh, talking to uh, attorneys that I think um, I, I am quite aware are uh, you know extremely uh, hyper vigilant and uh, always thinking, and uh, therefore have difficulty turning their brains off at night, right? And um, so this is something that's uh, quite near and dear to me because uh, insomnia is such a such a huge problem. But I think you know, um, looking at it broadly, sleep health is something that people have only probably recently recognized, and although it's it's been uh, you know given quite a bit of press, um, the awareness about sleep as a part of your overall health and well-being is relatively recent. Um, and I think what, what, what we found is that sleep not only affects your physical health, 
which is of course, you know, important. It, it affects your cardiovascular system. It affects, you know, diabetics. It affects your immune system. So there's a lot of physical um, impacts to poor sleep, but it also affects your mental health, which of course is incredibly important and in, and in the news lately. So depression, anxiety, manic depressive cycles, all of these are intimately related to how well the brain is rested at night. And then um, it also affects your emotional health. So the fact that you're able to thrive and be alert and happy and productive is all um, you know, impacted by your sleep quality. So I, I don't think I'd be far off the mark to say that sleep really impacts every body system and every aspect of our health. Um, and you know, it, it's been, uh, you know, one of the things I love about being a sleep doctor is that it's a constant new discovery, right? We're learning more and more every day about how sleep impacts uh, different things. And, you know, when somebody points it out, you sort of say, aha, I, you know, I've experienced that myself. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, if you sleep poorly at night, let's say you have a very bad night and you haven't slept really well at all. I think you'll find yourself um, just irritable you know, the next day and, and not in a good mood and not able to, do, to, to be at your best. And if this happens in more than one night, you can imagine the impact it has cumulatively. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we, we are able to um, really look at sleep as a third of one's life. You know, eight hours of every 24 hours should be spent in sleep and naturally it's gonna have a huge impact. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I, I think it's it's something that all of us should be very aware of and really pay more attention to. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we could dig into some of the specific ways. You know, you as a doctor, you mentioned physical health, emotional health, mental health. Without going too deeply into the science, since we're lawyers, not doctors, but just some of those brain systems, the brain body correlation. Can you talk about what sleep is a complete, like why do we sleep? I think some of us are curious, why do we spend a third of our life unconscious? And then what does sleep do for us that impacts those other systems? Uh, what a great segue, Kendra. And I, I was hoping you'd ask that because I think that um, the question of why we sleep has been a bit of a mystery for ages. Um, but, you know, more and more we're recognizing that number one, sleep is not a static state. So it's not, a, it's not awake and asleep. Sleep itself is very dynamic and you go through different stages of sleep. And most likely every single stage of sleep and every transition has its own importance that we're just learning about. So when we think about how, um, you know, why we sleep, you know, it, it seems counterintuitive, right? So for a um, organism to suddenly stay immobile and sort of like, you know, at, at the mercy of the predators around, if you will, right? One would think, why does one do that? Um, we found that sleep has incredible regenerative and recuperative uh, characteristics. One of the things we know is that our brain during the day is like a sponge, right? It's, it's absorbing all kinds of information coming from all different sources. Um, and more and more neural networks are being formed at night. And all of that information is being collated in this little organ in our brain. And at night, what happens is that you finally have a chance to disconnect. And uh, one of the quotes I love is, we uh, sleep to remember and we sleep to forget. So what does that mean? That means that when we sleep, one of the things that ha happens is that the important information like learning and memory that needs to be consolidated has a chance to do it. So there are, there's an incredible strengthening of synaptic um, connections. And so important information is stored away and strengthened. But there's a whole lot of extraneous information. Like as, as people are listening to this webinar, there's probably you know, the colors of the walls around them, or you know, maybe there's a, there's a book on their site. I mean, all of that information is, is entering their brain, but it's not really important information. 
you know, there's probably a few nuggets that they need to take away from today's hour long talk that when they sleep at night, hopefully that gets consolidated. But all of that stuff that we don't need actually gets eliminated. And that allows the brain to now start gathering more information the next day. So I think that, you know, one of the most important uh, uh, functions of sleep is really allowing our brains to reboot, uh, if you will, if, if you think about a computer. It also allows our body to regenerate. So as we fall asleep, um, it's interesting, uh, and only recently people have found this, uh, have, have started to understand this, is that our sleep is, you know, we always think of the sleep as a brain phenomenon. Right, we think about, okay, so when, when we're asleep, we're either you know, unconscious or conscious and we, we can't remember things. But I think it's important for you to note that every single organism in this whole world sleeps, right? Even if they don't have brains, jellyfish sleep. Every cell in our body has a circadian clock. And so there's this giant planetary rhythm that is occurring every night. And our brain is part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And I think we're understanding more and more that sleep is important to every part and every tissue of our body. So um, that, that sort of in short should, should tell you how incredibly important this state is and why we really need to protect it as much as we can, because it's gonna allow us to live our other two thirds of our life uh, in a much more healthy way. Okay, that's absolutely fascinating because I was definitely one of the people who thought it was just a brain mechanism. I was actually thinking that as you were talking, like, is anything else impacted by sleep? But that's fascinating that organisms without brains rest or sleep as well, and that we have almost a universal circadian rhythm. Yes, absolutely. In fact, every, um, you know, there, there have been studies of pancreatic cells. Um, that show that every, you know the, the the cells in the pancreas that control the secretion of insulin are also affected by daylight and night, and also by our eating cycles. And so, more and more people are thinking: Is diabetes a disruption of our circadian rhythm? And is diabetes a manifestation of an abnormal sleep wake? So, you know, pe we know now, for example that people who are shift workers or people with jet lag disorder often have higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, of diabetes, of mental health disorders. And, 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 and think about it. I mean, our planet rotates on its axis. Every single living organism has evolved in this sort of like day and night um, circadian rhythm. And our genetic code is actually um, engaged in this. So when we disrupt our sleep, we're actually disrupting nature's way of keeping us in a biological rhythm. It's just fascinating. That, okay, thank you. We'll probably have some more questions um, come up. I will probably think of some questions about that. Just understanding from a foundational level, what is this phenomenon? What, I mean, I don't know, maybe we haven't covered that. What is, what is actually happening? I feel like, I don't know, where it was, but at some point I read, it, you know, sleep has been called a little death. You know, like what is what is the actual phenomenon that's happening when we transition from consciousness to unconsciousness to sleep, and then back into wakefulness or consciousness? Sure. So, you know, I I think that uh, again, there, there's some fascinating insights into this. So, if I asked you, Kendra, today, um, you know, when you went to sleep last night how long did it take you to fall asleep? I think you could probably answer me in uh, uh, probably a rather imprecise fashion and say, yeah, I think, I think I fell asleep in 20 minutes or 10 minutes, but I don't think you'd be really sure, okay? Um, if you have insomnia, however, you'll know that oh, I, was, I was looking at the clock and I couldn't fall asleep till one or two o'clock in the morning. But most people have what we call um, sleep, sleep, um, insomnia, which means you don't remember exactly the time you fall asleep, but yet your brain, when we study uh, the brain during sleep, in our sleep studies, we can actually um, tell you the exact second that your brain transitions from a wake to a sleep state, right? And then every single stage of sleep has its own, I'll say, EEG signature. So we can tell, aha, this patient's in stage one, now he's in stage two, now he's in REM. 
And every time your brain transitioned through these stages, um, there's a different metabolic activity. So, you know, for example, you might think that when you're, when you're asleep, you are sort of disconnected from your environment and, you know, you're sort of quote unquote unconscious, little death, as you said, right? But studies have shown that in certain stages of sleep, like REM sleep, there are certain parts of the brain that have a higher blood supply and a higher glucose consumption than even when you're awake. So that there are important functions going on within your brain while you're asleep that are actually incredibly important to revitalizing the organism. Um, and so absolutely, so sleep shouldn't be considered a static state. It's actually a very dynamic state. The only difference is that you it, it's sort of your escape from the consciousness, right? I almost feel like, um, you know, one of the things I, I, I really encourage people to do is to, um, is to think of sleep as something that's really a gift. You know, if you think about people who are, you know, and I, I hate to bring this up, but you know, there are people that are grieving today, right? From all these traumatic events that are occurring. The only escape they will have is when they sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a gift that we need to preserve. And so um, I think that when we think about sleep in those terms, about it being something that really rejuvenates us and allows us to sort of, you know, get back into our humanity the next day, um, I, I think you see it in a different perspective. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and that the brain is still active because as you're describing it, I'm thinking, you know, for those of us who are parents, it's not as if you're completely shut off. And and I was noticing it even the other night when I was sleeping, I have a teenage daughter who sleeps in the basement, two floors beneath me. She got up in the middle of the night and dropped a cup. And I was up like a bolt of lightning. But there are things we sleep through. I sleep through the air conditioning coming on and off. I sleep through my husband's sleep issues, which is something you and I have talked about. But that cup, knowing that my daughter was awake, woke me up instantly. What is that phenomenon that some things wake us up, like our children or hearing a door open or something sort of high alert, but other things our brain is disregarding? Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it's definitely a learned phenomenon. And I, and I think that uh, mothers in particular uh, seem to be, you know, very sensitive to their own children or, or their own child, you know, in distress or awake. Um, husband's not so much from what I hear. <laughs> he didn't wake up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but but that's certainly true. And there are some uh, some genetic predispositions uh, to the strength of the sleep signal. I'll say. Sure. So there are some uh, people, for example, uh, that the minute you know, I, I always uh, you know joke about this, but you know what? My parents used to live in England. So when I traveled to to London, for example, taking off. I'd really feel jealous of the people around me that could, you know, the minute the plane took off, they'd be like out, you know, like a light. And I, I couldn't sleep on a plane, you know, to save my life. And so there are certain people that have really strong, incredibly strong sleep signals, right? But on the other hand, there are some people that if there's a wrinkle on the bed, they can't sleep. Or if they're in a new environment, they can't sleep. So some of that is genetic. Uh, some of it obviously is learned as well, but I think that uh, you know we you know when we think about sleep, part of it is our own genetic uh, makeup, part of it is environment, and part of it is learned behavior. And I think untangling those uh, is, some, is sometimes quite helpful when we're dealing with issues like um, you know insomnia or difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, you know things like that. Sort of understanding you know how our brain works to create those rhythms uh, is, is sometimes quite helpful. Perfect, and I know we'll get into a lot of those. My my husband calls me a sleeping princess. So it has to be dark and cool and just right, or I can't fall asleep. And so, um, so I'm jealous of the people, like you said, who can just fall asleep, you know, sitting up in a chair, <laughs> take a little cat nap. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Jagdeep, we have a couple of questions. And these are great questions, so keep these coming. So I'm going to jump in here um, with the questions, and then we can move back into some of the questions I have for you. The first one that came in 
that I saw was uh, how does sleep deprivation affect the immune system? Excuse me, system specifically. You were talking about different impacts on the brain and the body, the immune system. How is that impacted when we don't get enough sleep? Yeah, very interesting. And especially during this whole pandemic, this has been a, a, a an area of research. So it seems that the uh, that sleep is important for both T cell function and antibody uh, formation. And uh, one of the earliest studies about this came when they looked at patients who had influenza vaccines and they had two cohorts of people, one that were not allowed to sleep. So they would, they would be waking up frequently throughout the night and the other ones that were allowed to sleep their natural sleep. And sure enough, the people with disrupted sleep patterns had lower antibody levels than those with, um, you know, uh, that, that were allowed to sleep long. So that was, that was a sort of the first study that showed that for influenza vaccines, there's a clear differentiation between sleep deprivation and not. And then if you look at the COVID data today, you can, there's, there's a significant amount of evidence today that people who were hospitalized and that slept poorly had worse outcomes than those people that had, you know, uh, normal sleep during their COVID. Uh, so, so I think that, um, you know, the, the idea that immune function is related to sleep is gathering more and more evidence today. And certainly I think that many of us may have experienced, um, you know, anecdotally, my mom would say like, hey, you know, for example, I'll give you uh, uh, something that I think most of us have experienced. When you fall sick and you have a fever, what happens for those four or five days? You are sleeping way more than you normally do. And your body is taking that sleep and allowing your immune system to rev up and recover. Um, and, and the opposite is true as well, that if you sleep deprive yourself for you know, many, many days, you're more likely to fall sick. So both of those are true. But there is now you know, uh, scientific evidence to show that the actual antibody responses are blunted when you uh, have sleep deprivation. Another reason, another one, another of the many reasons to make sure that we're getting enough sleep. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to zip through a couple more of these questions and then I'll again get back into our agenda, but they're just great. Um, another question. How, why is it that when we're about to fall asleep and, and I've had this happen too, so I don't know how many other people will resonate with this. We have our herky jerky motion. I think it's a perfect way this person described it. What, what is happening? Can you explain what's happening when you feel that sort of like, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and you know we uh, actually have I've seen patients who come to my clinic because they're worried about it, right? And um, there's actually a scientific name for that. It's called a hypnic jerk, H Y P N I C, a hypnic jerk. And what happens is that as we're falling asleep, suddenly you feel like as if you're almost like your leg is you know just jerking, or you know part of your yeah. body is sort of like uh, jerking. Um, we think that that's what, what happens in in different stages of sleep is that your muscle tone suddenly falls, right? And it happens most significantly in REM sleep. So in REM sleep, your muscle activity is completely diminished. Uh, we actually think that that's a protective mechanism. We can, we can get, that, uh, get into that uh, you know, in later conversation. But what might be happening in, the, in these situations is that the muscle activity is falling before your brain alertness has fallen into the sleep state. So you suddenly, you feel your muscles are relaxing or you know, almost going limp or jerking before your sleep onset. Um, this is usually a pretty benign phenomenon. Uh, so it's not something to necessarily be worried about. Um, and I think most of you will know this, that this happens when you are extremely tired. So when you've sort of like, you know, stayed up too long or when you, you know, you maybe had a glass of wine or two, and you're, you're just about to you know, fall asleep and all of a sudden your body sort of jerks open. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a pretty common situation. And most times, 90% of the times, it is not indicative of a significant sleep disorder. That's interesting. Okay. And, and that has a name. So we all feel at least it's not, not yep. just us. <laughs> that has that happen. Um, let's see. Another one. How well, <clears throat> excuse me. How well do Fitbit and other devices actually measure our sleep and our sleep cycles? So you were talking about, you know, watching the REM sleep and you know, watching 
these, you know, fancy machines that you all have as sleep doctors, but we all think we can buy it and put it on our wrist. Um, we recognize that these aren't the same quality as what you're doing in a sleep study, but are they useful at all? How well do you see them be giving yeah. us data? What a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I love sleep technology and, and I'll, I'll sort of go into it a little bit. So when we do an actual sleep study in a sleep center, what we are measuring is the changes in your EEG or your electroencephalogram as, as your brain goes through different stages of sleep, right? Um, but other things happen in sleep that we call surrogates, right? So when we fall asleep, one of the things that happens is that we're, either, you know, when you're awake, you're always moving to some extent, right? But when you're asleep, you're pretty still. So if you take a, a, a little device that just tells you like, are you moving or are you still? That's called an actigraph, right? So most older technology that told you whether you're asleep or awake used actigraphy as their model. It's basically an accelerometer that looks at, at movement in different axes. So when you have a watch on, it'll just tell you whether you're moving or not. And it turns out that it's sort of like, you know, 70, 80% accurate. So if you're moving around, you know, uh, regularly, you're probably awake. And when you're still, you're probably asleep. So that was the first iteration of that technology. But more recently, there's even more uh, accurate technology. So, so I'll give you an example. So when we, um, when we look at uh, devices, they can actually measure the um, pulse rate or the cardiac rate that happens throughout the night. And it turns out that your heart rate is a very good indicator of whether you're asleep or not. So now certain stages of sleep have certain variations in your pulse rate that can be used in an algorithm to tell you whether you're asleep or not. So depending on the device you're talking about, so something like the Aura Ring, for example, is very accurate in terms of you know, whether you're asleep or not. Now, not as accurate as an EEG on your brain, but other devices um, you know, may not be as accurate. And it really sort of, uh, I would say that you sort of need to dig a little bit deeper and say, hey, what signal are you measuring? And how does it correlate? And what studies have been done? So, so if somebody comes to me, I say that you know, all of these devices that you use to measure your sleep are probably okay from a trend perspective but don't expect it to give you the exact amount of sleep that your brain is getting. But I think directionally, most of these devices are pretty accurate. So if you can, you know, if you wear, for example, an aura ring or, you know, a, an Apple watch, um, over time, it'll give you a trend. Like I, I, is your sleep patterns increasing or decreasing? I think those are pretty, uh, pretty useful. Okay, no, and that's helpful. And it's, I think that's a great way to look at it because I can imagine just some people are more active in their sleep. You know, I sleep like a log. My husband makes fun of me. I don't move at all. So I've got to think maybe it's a little more accurate. But people who I've got a couple of kids who roll over and flail and, yep. you know, if it's just measuring activity, then to your point, eh, maybe we're closer to that 70 to 80 percent accuracy. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Fascinating. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, maybe in the same vein as that, I had a question. Can you address sleep paralysis? Sure. Yeah, um, it, it's sort of a little bit akin to what I talked about when your muscle tone drops. So um, what happens during REM sleep is that your muscle tone is at the lowest of your whole 24-hour period, okay? Now, if, if you go into what we call REM state physiology whilst awake, then your muscles are paralyzed, okay? And let, let me describe what sleep paralysis is because maybe everybody doesn't know exactly what that term means. What happens is that sometimes when people wake up, they feel like they can't move at all. And it can be quite frightening. And it can be quite a, um, you know, panic type sensation because for, you know, a minute or two, they're awake, they're aware of their surroundings, but they just simply cannot move their arms or legs. That's called sleep paralysis. Now, sleep paralysis can be a symptom of certain sleep disorders like narcolepsy, for example, uh, patients who have narcolepsy have sleep, uh, have sleep paralysis, but sleep paralysis can also be a benign phenomenon. It's also something that if it occurs very infrequently, 
you know, or, or just on occasion and is not associated with daytime sleepiness or fatigue or any other sleep symptoms, you're probably okay. But I would say that if you're experiencing sleep paralysis more frequently, you should probably at least have a consultation with a sleep physician to say like, hey, am I, am I in the normal spectrum or is this something that I should be worried about? That's helpful, thanks. Um, yeah, I think I've only had that a couple of times and apparently a few of you have had it as well enough to know what it's called. And that does sound terrifying. Um, and worth. this is helpful, Jagdeep, to help us understand what is mostly benign and just something we live through in a normal human experience and what is worth getting checked out. So thanks for letting us know yeah. the difference. Yeah. I, again, I mean, if you're experiencing sleep paralysis, maybe once a month or something like that, I mean, I, I, you know, as long as you're not experiencing other symptoms with it, you're okay. okay. But if it's m more frequent than that, I would at least have a conversation. Okay. Perfect, thank you. I've got three questions that are sort of in the same line, so I'm going to do my best to combine them. So if I don't give you them perfectly clearly, just ask me and I'll repeat them. So yeah. they're all aligned with how much sleep do we need is the sort of the basic foundational one. Yep. And then something related is can we make up for lost sleep by taking naps or is that sleep just gone? And then the again, another related question is, is it essential to get eight hours of continuous sleep or can we get four hours of sleep, two hours of wake time, four hours of sleep? So it's all how much sleep and can it be broken up over the course of 24 hours? Yeah, uh, what a great question. So first of all, when people ask me how much should I sleep, um, we can point to a couple of different things. Um, in general, I would say that if you are alert and, and uh, very functional during the day, you probably are getting enough sleep. But if you're feeling, you know, tired or, you know, feeling like, you know, towards the afternoon, I have like this dip, you know, you should ask yourself, hey, is it, is it a problem with the amount of sleep I'm getting? Now, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has done very large epidemiolo epidemiologic studies. And it turns out that most adults need somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. That's, that's the normal population. But like anything else, you know, if you take our height or weight, right? If you say, what's the normal height? Well, you know, I could tell you what the average height is, but it's, it's, it's what the distribution is what's on called a Gaussian curve, right? So there's people to the right and the left of that curve. But when do you think that it's abnormal? So if somebody sleeps for less than five hours regularly or more than nine hours regularly, that is typically I would say outside of the 90th percentile of normal, right? So um, can there be somebody that sleeps less than five hours and, and is getting enough sleep? Yes, but it becomes less and less likely from a percentage perspective, right? And I always start worrying about like, you know, are they really getting enough sleep? Um, from, a, from a practical standpoint, what I would tell people is that if you find yourself sleeping X number of hours from Monday to Friday, but then you sleep in on weekends, that means that you're trying to recover from sleep deprivation, right? You should really be sleeping the same number of hours every night if that's normal sleep. So people who sleep in on weekends or sleep in on vacations, they probably are sleep deprived. And, and uh, Kendra, as you know, as a society, we are sleep deprived. You know, we burn the candle at both ends. We watch the news at night. We, do, we love our electronics. I mean, we are definitely it's something that we all need to be uh, very concerned about. Now, in terms of, you know, should you be having one consolidated period of sleep or can it be broken up? Um, it's interesting. There are some studies that show that our ancestors maybe had biphasic sleep, right? So they, were, they would sleep for four or five hours and they, they would hunt and gather when the when the dawn came out, for, you know, and then they would fall back to sleep. But I think in the in the modern era, most people believe that a single consolidated uh, period of sleep is probably more normal. Um, and and that sort of you know you know one comment I'd like to make is about naps because many people have questions about naps, right? Is it is it okay to nap? Is it not okay to nap? And you know, certainly there are countries like Spain where a siesta is very normal and encouraged, right? It's part of their culture. So, so what, what can we say about naps? And what I tell my patients is, 
that if you sleep well at night and if you can nap, more power to you, right? Enjoy that nap, enjoy your sleep, no problem. But if you have insomnia, if you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, do not nap, right? Because you are really actually worsening your tendency for insomnia at night if you nap during the day. So it depends on your, um, I'll, I'll say your, your nighttime sleep. Uh, so that, that's sort of my, uh, my advice about naps and, and sleep duration. Okay, so oh, and that's one, helpful. One last, okay. uh, sorry, one, yeah. one last little point I'd like to make is that the duration of sleep also varies by age, right? Mm -hmm. So young kids need way more sleep than adults. And I think that, uh, you know, young children and adolescents should get nine, 10 hours of sleep as a normal. While in adults, you can, you can come back to that seven or eight hours of sleep. So if you have young kids or adolescents at home, and if they're being rowdy or irritable or you know, not doing well at school, think, are they getting enough sleep at night? It, it is critical that they get more than seven hours or eight, more than eight or nine hours of sleep actually is, is what's yeah. recommended. I think it is tricky with the teenagers because, um, and I know our school district changed their hours and I'm wondering, you know, you've seen those probably. And, yep. and I think it made a lot of sense because the teenagers were, were staying up late with activities and homework, but then the school districts were saying, oh, well, they're, they can get up early and get on the bus earlier than the other kids, but these teenagers are only getting you know, maybe six, seven hours of sleep. So they started pushing back because the younger kids went to bed earlier. And so the teenagers were really suffering and were sleep deprived. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that we should be aware about too, is that uh, when we think about sleep time, right, seven hours to nine hours, you know, whatever it might be, there's also a circadian pattern to that. So as you start going from childhood into adolescence, you have a normal sleep delay, right? Uh, it's called a phase delay. So teenagers, their, their melatonin secretion and their body rhythms actually are delayed. So it is very normal for somebody who's 16 to 19 or 20 years old to go asleep late. They, they can't fall asleep earlier. You know, if you let your teenager go to bed at nine o'clock, it's not gonna happen. Right. So I think that you, you, you need to take into account the fact that teenagers typically are, are phase delayed, we call it. And the opposite mm -hmm. happens in our grandparents. Right. So grandparents sleep earlier and wake up earlier. And that's just the normal sort of rhythm of sleep that occurs as we age. That's helpful, because I think sometimes we think it's just our kids or just our parents or our grandparents. But that's a very normal, a normal thing. Perfect. Okay. Well, what, and we've touched on some of these, but as a sleep doctor, what are some of the most common sleep complaints that you hear? I, we've mentioned some insomnia, but dig deeper if you could, you know, what are you hearing from people that are their, their main complaints? Yeah, I would say that there are two uh, sleep complaints that predominate that sort of probably make up 80% of my practice. And then there's about 20% of other complaints. So let's, let's just start with you know, the biggest complaint I have is insomnia, right? And that could be difficulty either falling asleep or staying asleep or waking up too early or just feeling like their sleep is not restful, right? That is, that is the whole syndrome of insomnia. The other large category, I would say, um, you know, certainly in the US is uh, sleep apnea. And these are patients that are excessively sleepy and fatigued and tired during the day. They just never feel rested. And, um, you know, the characteristic symptom that they have at night is snoring and maybe abnormal breathing patterns. So sometimes people might notice that they're stopping breathing or they gasp at night. But, but even without that, I think if you snore and if you have abnormal, just feeling, you know, just poorly rested, uh, that's called sleep apnea. And, uh, you know, there are various sort of subcategories of sleep apnea and sleep related breathing disorders, we call them. Uh, but those are uh, very important, mainly because if you treat the sleep apnea, you can have a huge impact on people's lives. Um, and, I, and I mean, both the, the patient and the spouse. So I think that's a, that's a critical uh, one. And then the last 20% are those patients that have abnormal behaviors. So they have sleep walking or sleep terrors or you know, um, nightmare disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, all of those sort of lumped up into this category called parasomnias. 
So even though there are probably more than 150 sleep disorders that we know about, um, broadly it's in these three buckets. Either people can't sleep or they're too sleepy or they have some abnormal patterns of behavior at night. Those are our, those are our typical sort of patient groups. Right. I'm taking good notes. That's so, that's so fascinating how the percentages break down and that the vast majority are this insomnia. They just can't get to sleep. And yep. it sounds like even from the questions we're getting, that's what people are really struggling with or have struggled with historically. And maybe as we think about our attorney population, burning that candle at both ends, staying up too late, working, maybe playing on technology, as you mentioned, whatever it is, but staying up too late. And then let's talk about what that does for us. We talked about what it does physiologically and sort of the purpose of sleep in our brain, but could you talk about how it impacts our work, like our, our work performance, our productivity, the actual work that we're trying to accomplish during the day? Absolutely. So I think that, uh, you know, when you sleep poorly, you perform poorly, right? Um, both from a memory learning perspective and a performance perspective. So I'll tell you honestly, you know, as a sleep doctor, I have become more and more fearful that if I ever need surgery, I want my surgeon to have had, had a good night's sleep before. It is tremendous how much difference there is in terms of performance when you have a good or bad night's sleep. Um, Many companies are, or you know, more and more companies now are telling their executives that if you fly across the world for a meeting, you cannot take an impactful decision for the 20, first 24 hours, right? Because we know that our judgment is impaired. We know the fact that our learning and memory is impaired when we can't, when we don't sleep well, and that only compounds if it's more than one night. So. Um, you know, the other thing that, that people will notice is that they just feel more irritable um, and they don't feel as calm. And so I think as a, 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 certainly for attorneys, it is so critical that you are focused and alert and able to absorb information, you know, as, you, as you're in meetings or with clients or certainly in trial. Um, and I think that the impact of the loss of sleep the night before you know, I, I would not underestimate that at all. So um, that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is that um, I suspect that it's sort of a double whammy because not only do you need to be, you know, completely aware and alert during the next day, but the previous day, I, I have to believe that, especially before a big trial or something, you must be inundated with those thoughts to say like, hey, have I missed something? You know, do I need to, you know, go over you know, this testimony well, like one more time. And so disciplining yourself to say like, hey, I need to turn off my brain because it's going to help me perform better the next day, right? That sort of discipline and understanding I think is, uh, is critical and uh, it's not easy. You know, I mean, I, I get it. Uh, all of us have lives and we burn candles at both ends. But I think the more you practice it and the more importance you give to sleep, uh, the more likely it is that you'll be able to get a better balance. Yeah, that makes a, another question that we had that's I think directly related to that, or at least the example you just gave, is why is it harder to fall asleep or stay asleep? Because I was just thinking of the example you were just giving, you know, if you have a big trial the next day or you have something important that you need to finish, why is it so much harder to fall asleep and stay asleep when you're excited or nervous or anxious or or have those you know more more agitated feelings, positive or negative? What's happening there? Sure, you know we can look at it from a number of perspectives. If you look at it from a purely chemical perspective, right? If you think about why sleep onset occurs, um, there are actually chemicals in the brain that trigger sleep, right? So adenosine is one. GABA is another one where, you know, as you start, you know, from wakefulness to the, to the time you fall asleep, these chemicals start increasing in amount, right? There are also chemicals that keep us awake, like epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, that are sort of counteracting these, right? And so your awake hormones need to fall and your sleep hormones need to increase. So when you are revved up, what you're doing is you're increasing the hormones that typically keep you awake, 
the steroid hormones, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline, all of these hormones are sort of, and so you are actually changing the chemical balance of your brain when you're, when you are in, in these, in these situations of high anxiety. So it, it's natural. So I think what we need to sort of understand and learn is that the, you know, there are things like biofeedback and relaxation therapies, yoga, meditation, that can actually restore these hormonal balances back towards normal. And I think that, you know, understanding that, yes, it is perfectly normal for me to feel anxious and have this sort of emotion before a trial, but I'm going to try and do some uh, counteractive measures that I know will work too. And part of it is understanding how to shut off your brain and how to sort of distract yourself towards more relaxing activities and focus on sort of, you know, mindfulness and things like that prior to sleep onset, having that routine, avoiding, you know, don't, don't look at disturbing news or, or, or read, you know, things on your computer or watch, you know, movies prior to falling asleep, have a relaxing bed routine and reinforce that when you know that those times are coming, when you, when you need that uh, extra, you know, uh, help. Um, so, so the, I, I would say those are the things that, you know, uh, the more we're aware of, the more we can control. Yeah, that makes so much sense. The the hormones that you're actually fighting yourself, your body is trying to sleep and you're injecting these sort of anti-sleep hormones with your thoughts primarily. So, exactly. oh, and that's a related thing. You just mentioned things to do or not to do before sleep. Another question had come in, could you just talk about the effect of staring at devices um, before sleep, computers, cell phones, TVs? How does that impact our sleep? Yeah, so um, our, our brain actually is uh, regulated by our day and night cycle. And we talked about the planetary you know, uh, effect of, on all our organisms and really how light affects our brain is through the retina, right? So light hits our retina, that signal goes back through the optic nerve into a little, uh, into a little area of the hypothalamus called uh, the pineal gland. And uh, that there's, there's, a, there's about a bundle of 10,000 neurons that are sensitive to light, okay? And that bundle of neurons actually turns your brain off and on from sleep to wake, okay? So it's actually light hitting those neurons that actually is causing your brain to cycle back and forth between sleep. There are also certain wavelengths of light that are better or worse. So blue wavelength sort of is very powerful in terms of turning those 10,000 neurons on, right? And uh, melatonin is one of the signals that, that it responds to as well. But most importantly, light. So when we turn our computers on or our iPhones on, what you're doing is you're simulating daylight. And all of these devices have intense blue uh, light. So when blue light hits your retina, goes back into your pineal gland, you are actually signaling your brain hey, by the way, it's time to stay awake or keep, you know, keep awake. And so, uh, so you are actually duplicating a physiologic signal that over eons has been training your brain to stay awake. So uh, you really, you, obviously we need to avoid those signals, uh, especially in people who can't fall asleep well at night. Fascinating, because I think we've heard that, you know, turn off your phones or turn off your screens or don't look at it or turn on the, the warm light if you're going to look at your device. But that explains right. why. Yeah. You're, trying to, you're trying to block the blue light, the blue light. And, and, you know, those wavelengths that are, that are excessively stimulating to the brain. So it does help to have, you know, the night mode on your devices. Uh, but I would say even better is to not have the device at all. We're trying to find tricky ways to get around. We want to keep our devices in our hands. They're like, well, maybe if I just turn on the, the night filter, I can keep playing on do the wordle before bed and it'll be fine. Exactly, exactly. Doug Deep, what we think about attorneys and insomnia, which you had mentioned, how would someone know if they had a problem with insomnia? So what are what are they looking for? What are the symptoms? And then you mentioned some specific ways and maybe we can dig a little more deeply so people walk away with these practical sleep hygiene kinds of tips. How do they know if they've got a problem and what do they do about it? So first of all, I think, um, you know, what I'd like to, uh, you know, convey is that sleep is a very natural biological rhythm and 
Insomnia really is the loss of the body's confidence in its own ability to stay in that rhythm, right? And it's really almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the more worried I am, the worse I'm gonna have uh, in terms of my insomnia symptoms. So one of the things I tell my patients is that if you have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, it's a very frustrating symptom, but it's not something that cannot be reversed. So be confident that your body can take care of itself. You know, um, and, and there are techniques, of course, that we, we use to do it. And, you know, obviously we don't have enough time to really go into, you know, all, all of the interventions we do. But part of it is to not fear insomnia, right? And, and trust your own body. Um, but there are certain things that most insomniacs do. Uh, and, and by the way, insomnia is something that we all experience on occasion. It's only when it persists over time and affects our daytime functioning that it becomes an issue. Um, one of the things that, that I would say we should try and avoid is alcohol before bedtime. Because what happens is when you can't sleep, the, the, um, the motivation is that let me have a, you know, a nightcap or two because that'll put me to sleep. And I think that is true. So alcohol does have help people fall asleep quicker. But three to four hours later, reliably, alcohol will cause sleep disruption. And when you wake up the next morning, you're gonna feel worse, right? So over time, uh, alcohol actually worsens the problem. Second thing is avoid electronics at night. Mm. Third thing is do not have time cues in your room, right? So um, I'll give you an example. So if, if, if I'm a really good and healthy sleeper, right? And I happen to wake up at three o'clock in the morning one night, I'm gonna look at the clock and I'm gonna be so happy because I'm like, yes, I have four more hours. I'm gonna like, you know, totally pass out. What, what fun, right? I'm gonna have four more hours of sleep. But if, if I'm an insomniac, that's same, that same stimulus. I'm gonna wake up at three o'clock, look at that clock. And I'm gonna be terrified. I'm gonna be like, oh my God, I have a huge case tomorrow. I have to go to trial. I have only four more hours. Now I have to force myself to sleep. And so now you, you are subconsciously gonna get more anxious. So I would say that one of the things is take any time cues out of your room, because who cares? It's not time to wake up. If you need an alarm, have an alarm clock, have it face the wall, right? Do not look at the clock, uh, you know, uh, when you're sleeping. A few other things you can do is have a, have a relaxing bedtime routine, right? So make sure that you're, you know, you're listening to quiet music or, you know, reading your kind of bedtime story, or, you know, something that sort of winds you down from the day. Um, warm showers actually have been shown to be useful. So, you know, the body tends to fall asleep easier if its core temperature is falling. So that's probably a good thing. Um, having a quiet, comfortable, and cool nighttime environment is probably a good thing. Um, exercise is definitely good. So it, it helps you sort of, you know, um, rev your body up during the day so that it can fall asleep at night, but, but not too close to bedtime. So I would say, you know, yeah. two to three hours prior to bedtime, you know, I would say avoid strenuous activity. And then maybe a light snack before bedtime is okay, but not a heavy meal. So, you know, you can have a cookie with, you know, a little bit of milk or something is fine, but don't sort of, you know, really uh, have a large meal because it'll cause reflux and, and worse things. So those are just some of the things that you can do, uh, you know, as a routine for yourself. And how you mentioned, in addition, you, know, you mentioned insomnia being the largest percentage of complaints that you get, but then the next category you mentioned was apnea or sort of disturbed sleep. And um, a question I wanted to ask you, and that came up also in the in the Q and A, is I've been told that I snore. Is this a problem? And can you tell us if it's a problem, why, and what maybe should be done about it? Yeah. So, so my God. Uh, in Sleep apnea is almost as large a problem as uh, as insomnia, and it it is, it is you know in this obesity epidemic of the United States, it's 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 uh, extremely common. So our upper airway is like a long, elastic, narrow, collapsible tube. Okay, it, that allows air to go from the atmosphere into our lungs. And the reason it's collapsible and uh, so malleable is because our larynx allows us to speak. So language has evolved so that our, our airway has to be very, you know, able to um, allow phonation. But the price we pay for it 
is that it can also collapse, right? So if you think about our airway, there are muscles all around it that are tonically keeping it sort of contracted and open. And at night, what happens in some people is that the muscles relax abnormally and they start and the airway starts narrowing. So the first thing that happens is air going in and out is gonna cause vibration and that's what snoring is. But if the airway relaxes even further, then there's obstruction of the airflow going into the lung. And so your blood oxygen levels start falling, your brain gets aroused, and the symptoms are you might stop breathing, <laughs> suddenly start, you know, it's like a snort arousal, we call it, or a gasping arousal. And the patient may not even know it. All they know is that they, when, when they wake up in the morning, they're sort of like headachey, they feel drowsy, they don't feel like they've, you know, had a good night's sleep, they might have a mm -hmm. dry mouth. And during the day, they're going to feel fatigued and sleepy. Yeah. So that is sleep apnea, and it can, and, and it not only affects how you feel, but it can increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, depression, car accidents. I mean, the list goes on. So I think this is something that is, uh, you know, really some that I, I would really encourage everybody. If you snore, and you have sleepiness during the day, or if your spouse snores and has sleepiness during the day. Mm -hmm do something about it. Get them a sleep study. It's, it's very inexpensive and easy to do now. You don't need to be in a sleep center. It's, there's a little device you can put on your finger, for example, that'll tell you whether you have sleep apnea or not. And the treatment is easily accessible and highly effective. So yeah, that's something that I would really okay. tell our audience to be careful about. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've shared with you and my husband's given me permission to share. That's actually what, you know, he has really severe sleep apnea and that was the only signal we had is he was snoring and it was keeping me awake and finally i was just like you gotta get this checked out turns out he has severe apnea and it needed needed treatment for it so it's definitely a, because you don't necessarily know you're sleeping like you said unless you wake up and don't feel quite right so sometimes if somebody's complaining about your snoring it's not just someone being you know annoying right. and saying you yep, you know, it might actually be a symptom of something much more severe. So to get that checked out, and I, um, I know that you you are an expert in that sort of apnea treatment as well. So we've got four minutes left. We've got six questions in the Q and A. So what I'm going to do, Jagdeep, is um, and actually maybe if you want, while I'm reading these questions, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to multitask. Um, maybe if you could just drop your email address in the chat. Um, that way, if anybody has any additional questions, but specific apnea questions, because as you said, that's a really significant problem that I think more people are struggling with than even realize. Um, thank you so much. So if you, oh, actually, could you assign that to everybody? I think it just went to the hosts and panelists. So maybe you oh, could drop sure. it in again. Um, in case you need, have a question about apnea specifically, you know where to reach Doug D. Um, so I'm going to rapid fire these six questions to you. We have three minutes, so we've got, you know, about 20 to 30 seconds for each. Okay, so here we go. The ch this is the challenge. First question. Since my freshman year in college, when I lived in a dorm, I've had the following form of insomnia. I wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Afterward, I can't fall back asleep. So frustrating. 20 years later, same sort of thing. I've never sought professional help, but I'm curious, what is happening? You sleep, you go to the bathroom, you wake up, you can't fall asleep. What's happening? Yeah, I, I, I think that you, the, the person does have insomnia and I, I, I would encourage them to actually go through something called cognitive and behavioral therapy. There are online options for that. Uh, but also I think, you know, one of the things that sometimes help is sleep restriction, where we actually help the person, we, we try to restrict the number of hours of sleep so that you get a better sleep quality than quantity. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, again, I would encourage them to talk, talk about this with, with a sleep doc because there's yeah. lots that can be done for insomnia. And I'm sure in general, a sleep hygiene technique would be to avoid drinking a lot of liquids, especially if you know that you're waking up Absolutely. to go to the bathroom. It's just, you know, maybe you actually need to restrict even sooner than the average person. Yeah, and if you, if you feel yeah. like your mouth is dry or something at night, uh, you know, suck on a piece of ice or something instead of having a glass yeah. of water. That's great. Okay, next question. Sometimes when I fall asleep or upon awakening in the morning, I hear a voice. Sometimes it says my name, sometimes it's other people. Is this common? It is not common. So uh, auditory, we call it auditory hallucinations. Um, it can be a symptom of a sleep disorder. And, and I would probably need to know much more about the other symptoms involved. It's hard to, hard to uh, sort of pinpoint that on a, on a quick one minute. So okay. yeah. That's fair. 
Okay, I think you already answered this, but do adults need less sleep? You could probably just do yes, no, but do they need less sleep as they become older? So uh, in general, very slightly less. So most uh, even 80 year olds need that seven to eight hours of sleep. It may not be in one consolidated period and often it's more fragmented, but they still need the same seven to eight hours of sleep. Yep. Got it. Um, how can people who work night shifts or travel often to other time zones help their own sleep pattern since they're being disrupted? Yeah, I, I hate to answer that in a minute because there's so many- I know, I'm so sorry. Here. I should have done that one first. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, you can wear glasses when you go home at night so that light is not hitting you and you know, make sure that you have a dark, quiet room so that you're able to sleep at night. Melatonin is, is one of the things that we use to sometimes do phase adjustments. But again, I, I, I hesitate because there's just so much more depth to this question mm -hmm. that, I, that I feel I, I probably can't answer in a minute or two. Yeah. And did you, I think I've heard you mention at least trying to stay, you know, when you're traveling time zones to try to stay on maybe the, the time zone that you're, you're headed home to, if you can, right? To keep that yes. timing yeah. as regular as possible. Depending on how long you're gonna be at the destination. So if you're, if you're gonna go, you know, to London for like a three day meeting and come back, you may not wanna do that. But if you're gonna be there for a week, you might want to. So again, it depends on your schedule. So um, when we talk about jet lag, it, you know, it, we really try to individualize our recommendations based on what that person is wanting to achieve on the other side. Okay, that's helpful. And I just got a note, I, you might've seen it too, that the webinar is open for a couple of minutes. So we don't need to exasperate ourselves trying to answer the rest of these questions. And if you, I have a couple of minutes, if you do too, and if anyone has any last questions, Lisa, are we good? We're good for a moment? Yeah, we can stay for like up to five more minutes if okay. people want to. Perfect. Okay. I think we're both good. I've got two more questions in the queue. And then if anyone else has any final questions, that should give us a nice soft landing and to be able to get the questions. Perfect. Um, this was a quick question that was reflecting back on the napping question that you talked about. Um, the question is some cultures are positive about 20 minute naps or so, and some say more than that isn't great. So if you were, I think just to maybe reiterate what you were saying, just those short little siestas or naps as opposed to a two hour nap. Yeah, and, and you know, um, I think the science on this is not completely, uh, has not reached a really good conclusion. I think we know that naps that last more than 60 minutes probably are counterproductive um, and naps less than 15 minutes are probably too short. So somewhere in the 20 to 30 minute range seems to be uh, the most beneficial uh, from the literature that's out there today. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want Thank to you. That's to get into that first REM episode, which usually is between twenty and thirty minutes. So you want to just stay, just stay at the beginning of the sleep cycle, just enough to wake you up. Okay. This is my final question, unless anyone else drops another question in. Um, this question asks: I am in my mid seventies. I often work or engage in other non-athletic activities until well past midnight, but I have no problem sleeping eight or ten hours past well past daybreak. Why is this? Is my unusual sleep pattern a learned behavior from a half century of practicing law? What is going on there? Yeah, so, you know, I think that uh, the time period at which people sleep um, often varies and it's often genetic. So there are people that are what we call night owls and there are people that are morning larks, right? And what I often tell people is that if you are happy with your sleep schedule, you don't need to conform with what society wants, unless your job requires it or your school requires it or something like that. But if you are sleeping eight to nine hours and you're perfectly alert during the day, more power to you. It doesn't matter what time you sleep. Um, I, I think that's perfectly fine. She probably is just a physiologic night owl and they, you sleep later and you wake up later. Great. Well, I, I love what you said earlier about those three components, genetic, environment, and learned and they they all come together to create our sleep schedule and our sleep habits exactly exactly lisa that's the end of the questions that i have we got to all i think we had about 15 16 questions so this has been a very active audience and we appreciate that and yeah. that's what we have for the group today thank you so much jagdeep and kendra Absolutely. this was amazing so i really appreciate your time yeah happy to be here all right. All right. Thank you Good so to much. see you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank Take you. Take care, everyone. everyone. Thanks for joining. Okay.
Sleep well. Bye-bye.